second. Thank you. Okay, so we're at 5A4, the last few lines on that page, uh, where it says, since the Mishnah. Um, and uh, we're going to start from there. Okay, and then we go into five, uh, 5B1. Okay, um, somebody want to volunteer, please? Thank you, Beryl. Since our Mishnah has mentioned the postponement of the observance of Tishba Av, the Gomorrah cites a discussion that mentions this postponement. Rav Elazar said, in the name of Rav Hanina, Rabbi planted a shoot on Purim. And, and, and you go ahead. And he bathed on the market day of. Tripori. Tsipori. 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 Tsi. Ah. Your line needs good glasses. On the seventh of Tum on the seventeenth of Tammuz, and he sought to abolish Tisha Tishabaav, but the sages did not agree with him in regard to Tishbaav. Okay. So we have three things that Rebbe is Rebbe being Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Judah the Prince. Uh, three things that he uh, either did or tried to do. So we have two things that he personally is reported to have done. Um, and that is that he planted some uh, young plant um, on Purim. And we'll have to look later on what's the big deal about that. But that seems to have been a very noteworthy thing that he did. Uh, the second thing is that on the market day, in Sipori, which means where a lot of people were around, he bathed on the 17th of Tammuz. So meaning he was seen to go into the public baths and uh, and to you know take a schwitz and a bath and so on. And everybody saw this on the 17th day of Tammuz. And the 17th day of Tammuz is, we're actually coming up to it this week, um, is the beginning of the three weeks of mourning that have been set aside to uh, remember the destruction of the first and the second temples in Jerusalem. And 17th of Tammuz is a fast day, traditionally, and um, Tisha B'Av three weeks later is the culmination of this three-week uh, 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 period. And then later on, or earlier, on the tenth of Tevet, we have another um, we have another uh, uh, fast day, and earlier than that, uh, we have the third uh, uh, of Tishrei, which is another fast day, Tzom Gedalia. So um, these are the four fasts that were set up uh, as memorials uh, for the destruction and uh, of of the temple and for the destruction of the Jewish community, and uh, the seventeenth of Tammuz is one of them. And it's understood that you shouldn't be bathing, you shouldn't be pampering yourself on these days. And yet, it's according to this uh, uh, eyewitness report, uh, or at least the hearsay from the eyewitness report, they say that this, that this is something that the most prominent rabbi of his time actually did. So that's a little bit, you know, eyebrow raising. Those are two things that he actually engaged in. And the third thing is more vague. He tried to abolish Tisha B'Av. So Tisha B'Av, as I said, is one of these four uh, uh, fast days, and it's the ultimate fast day of the four, because that's the day, the anniversary of the destruction of the temple itself. So that's the, the most serious of all the days. And, and, it, and according to this report, he wanted to uh, get rid of it. And... Um, and the sages uh, did not uh, go along with that. So the first two things are things that he actually did. So you know nobody, nobody, uh, um, you know it nobody else could stop him. But this other thing was something that he wanted to do for the entire community, and apparently he did not succeed. So this is this is um, certainly with the Tishabov report very. Um, you know, very, very radical. Um, what is he thinking? 
Um, and you know, Tisha B'Av exists to this very day. What was what was he trying to uh, to do? Why would he want to do something like that? So the uh, the Gemara itself is a little shocked by this report, and uh, this is what brings this piece of text into uh, relation to our Mishnah. So now let's read the next uh, the next paragraph before we before we pause. Go ahead. Rav Abba Bar Zavda presents a clarification. Rav Abba Bar Zavda said before Rav Elazar. Rabbi, that was not the case, that Rebbe wished to abolish the Tisha B'Av of every year. Rather, it was a year when Tisha B'Av fell on the Sabbath. And as usual, it was postponed till after the Sabbath, i.e. Sunday. And Rebbe said, since it is postponed from its regular day, let it be postponed altogether and not be observed this year. But the other sages did not agree with him. Upon hearing this from Rav Abba Bar Zavda, Rav Elazar applied the following verse to him. Two are better than one. Okay, the last part. Thank you. It's so good to have more than one person around to, to, to clarify this. By, by having you here, now we, we have a little bit better understanding of what happened. So what we, what we have here is a softening of the uh, report about what Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was trying to do. Um, no, God forbid that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was, was trying to uh, completely cancel out any observance of Tisha B'Av. No, 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 no. What it was was a particular year where Tisha B'Av was going to fall out on Shabbat. So then Rabbi Yehuda Nasi brought up the idea, look, instead of postponing Tisha B'Av to the next day, if it falls on Shabbat, then let it just be, you know, uh, canceled for that year. It can't be observed on Shabbat. If it can't be observed on Shabbat, then let's say, okay, thank you, sorry. You know, next year, if it falls out on Wednesday, we'll observe it, but not this year. So this is where we get back to our Mishnah, where our Mishnah talks about that there are certain observances, if they fall on Shabbat, they have to be postponed, as opposed to reading Megillah, when it falls on Shabbat, we don't do it on Shabbat, we make it earlier, right? That's the big difference between all the other uh, um, examples that the Mishnah gives and, uh, and Megillah. But now we have a report, according to Rav Abba Bar Zavda, that Rabbi Yehuda Nasi said, well, you know what? If it comes to Tisha B'Av, then let's just, if it if it falls on Shabbat, let's just forget about it. If it falls during the week, of course we should observe it. But if it falls on Shabbat, then let's say, okay, so that's the that's the, the luck of the draw, and, and we're not, Shabbat should, should, should cancel it out. Okay, so um, Sylvia, you have to, I can't hear you. Cannot hear you. Is your mic on? Now you're muted. Now you're not. Still can't hear you. Can anybody hear Sylvia? Nobody no. can hear you. I can't. Uh, what page? 5B1. Okay. <laughs> I saw you say thank you, but I can't hear you. I don't know what's going on. Uh, you can type in text, remember, if you can't be heard. Right, but she's, it says that she's unmuted, so we should be able to hear. So maybe your microphone got detached or something. Um, okay, so we're at, we're at 5B1, the top of the page there. Um, okay, so I want to just uh, uh, put out there that we have um, a pretty, you know, shocking short statement about Rabbi Huda Nasi that then the Gemara tries to backtrack on. Um, sages say, no, no, God, that, that can't be what he, what he, what he meant. Uh, all through um, the years, but especially now when, when certain amount of skepticism has become more acceptable in reading the text, um, modern scholars are more willing to entertain the possibility that the original simple meaning of that report might have been correct. And that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi 
at his period of time really did want to cancel Tisha B'Av's observance. Okay, wait a second. So how do I do that? That doesn't work. See, that's the problem. Um, okay. Um, so the, uh, um, the idea being, what's going on here? Why am I, there you are. I'm having a little technical glitches myself. Um, the idea being that apparently at his particular moment in, in history, this is about 200 CE, he is the leader of the Jewish community. The Jewish community in Judea, in Palestine, um, is of course um, a, uh, a, a community that is subject to Roman rule. But on the other hand, this is 130 years after the destruction of the temple and some uh, uh, a generation after the rebellion of Bar Kokhba, things have settled down. And the very fact that we have the ability of the Jewish community to produce a Mishnah, to be the first founding document of rabbinic Judaism, and that we study to this very day, we just had a little study of Mishnah this morning uh, from Pirkei Avot, the, the even that the fact that the, that a, a major cultural production was able to be uh, put forward successfully um, indicates that this the, this the standing of the community the situation was much much better than it had been in in quite a while and this now comes we have certain notes here that we could uh, look into more fully but this comes into the question of how long uh, should one mourn for a tragedy that happened long ago when so much has changed since that tragedy? So the, the, uh, the simple kind of idea would be you keep mourning a tragedy whose re consequences continue to be relevant today. But if the tragedy that happened has you know, it happened, it was awful, it was terrible, but it's no longer has any impact on anybody, then why should we be uh, uh, mourning? Why should we be, why should we be affected in, in, a, in a serious way by that? So the question, for instance, uh, that has been looked at by, by, by scholars, the first temple was destroyed in 586 BCE, right? hundreds and hundreds of years before the second temple was destroyed. We now say that we observe Tisha B'Av as the day of mourning for both temples. But let's go back in time. Let's go back in time to, let's say, 100 BCE. The second temple is standing. It hasn't been destroyed. The first temple was destroyed 450 years earlier. Did people observe those days of mourning in the time of the second temple? And the assumption is no, because redemption in some way or form had already occurred. We have a second temple. We have a replacement for the first temple. So yes, the first temple, its destruction was terrible. The, 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 the uh, loss of life and, and, and uh, of our sovereignty was terrible. But look at that, what we have now. Now we have, uh, you know, we're, we're back on our feet. So life goes on. So then when the second temple is destroyed, that's when we have it kicking back in. Oh, wait a second. We thought everything was all fixed up. We thought everything was, was, was uh, you know, erased from those sad, sad uh, times. And now we're seeing, wait a second, there's some kind of pattern here or there's some kind of lingering uh, uh, darkness that is still hovering over us. And Tisha B'Av kicks in, so to speak, with a vengeance uh, and becomes uh, important again. But now, as things have lightened up again, it's possible some scholars, this is all speculative, it's possible, say, some scholars, that what Rabbi Yehuda Nasi was saying is, hey, we're, we've got it pretty good. Let's appreciate how well it is that we have it. 
and that's, it, it's time to stop it already. It's time to stop mourning uh, in that serious way. Yeah, Jen. Um, I think you answered my question. I was looking for the context. I, I was wondering, like in Reform Judaism, since they don't want a rebuilt temple, does that mean there's no Tisha B'Av? Um, and I was wondering if uh, Emperor Julian had succeeded in rebuilding the temple, would we also have kicked off, you know, there would have been no Tisha B'Av then? Right. So the, the what if, we don't know. Right. Um, that, you know, the Julian is the what is the big what if. Oh, my goodness. Oh my <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, you know, that, that's the big lost opportunity. Too bad paganism didn't come back strong. Um, but, uh, but, uh, it's complicated. Uh, <laughs> I said it was complicated with Julian. <laughs> right. Yes, it was complicated with Julian. But, um, but yes, I think that in the reform movement, there is, um, you know, for, there was definitely, you know, classical reform had no use for Tisha B'Av. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, said, hey, we're in the New Jerusalem right now, you know, New York City or Cincinnati, of course, not to get New York City, Cincinnati, oh, really? New Jerusalem, <laughs> you know, Hebrew Union College or, or uh, you know, or Berlin or all of those places. So classical reform had absolutely no use for these fast days and so on. Now, there's a little more of an openness to the idea of its historical significance. Mm -hmm. And then you have um, a lot of uh, efforts um, and it's in our community too. And something that I have mixed feelings about. Um, let's take these days and make them relevant. So for instance, last year, um, BK and I think Nir Tamid used Tisha B'Av as a day to go demonstrate against ICE. Mm -hmm. so, so the idea of exile and the idea of, of people who are refugees and who are uh, uh, vulnerable and so on, they took that, that seed of a concept and then they said, okay, we're going to use the book of Eicha, which you know is a book of lamentation. We're going to read these lamentations as um, you know, as as a, a sensitization for us, or consciousness raising, for all the other people that are in exile today, and for all the other people that are uh, uh, suffering, that we need to be, <coughs> you know, aware of and stand by their side. We know what it means, like like the Torah says, you know what it means to be a stranger in Egypt, so stand up for the stranger. We know what it means. To have our homes destroyed, we know what it means to be kicked out of our of our of our homeland, and now let's feel that uh, uh, solidarity with other people. So it no longer becomes. One second, it no longer becomes um, really centered on the Jewish experience as a continuing source of pain, but rather the Jewish experience is a source of learning. Josie. Um, haven't people said it's time to stop only talking about the Holocaust? Is that yeah. the same reasoning that well, we have Israel and we've moved on? So, so I think that that's, I, I mean, yes, in that Israel is one of the big game changers here, right? And I think Israel has, has, uh, you know, changed, uh, uh the, 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 uh, the whole the whole context of the question for today for many people although mm -hmm. i think that that to a certain extent in america with the alienation that that and i don't just mean this 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 last decade or so but in general i mean israel i wrote about this a little bit in, in torah sparks um israel is an abstraction for most american jews mm -hmm. um israel doesn't really figure much in their uh uh in their ongoing set of concerns. Um, they may be happy that it's there. They may be proud. They may be willing to defend it, you know, it's standing in the world. They're very sensitive to anti-Semitism and Israel becomes, you know, a, a, a kind of a, you know, a, a focus on that question. But, you know, the reality is that American Jews have their own promised land. Like I said, you know, Cincinnati or New York, or even yeah. Louisville. Well, we, we, we're, we got it pretty darn good here, yeah. even with the unfortunate, terrible uh, tragedies of loss of life and anti-Semitism that we're seeing now, which, which of course, shake us up and, and are, uh, you know, matters of concern. But objectively speaking, there's never been a Jewish community anywhere that's been as well off and as, and as free 
as we are. As we are. So a lot of people figured, okay, it's a, you know, we'll let bygones be bygones. This is not what I'm what I'm interested in. Um, the Israel question is, I think, a much more pertinent question because the Israel question says, if you care about the Jewish people and you want to think about what is the existential situation of the Jewish people and are we in exile and are we uh, suffering and are we unredeemed and unfulfilled and so on, well, if that's your thing and not simply, I, you know, I got a good job, so what do I care? Um, but if it's about a Jewish destiny, then isn't this a sort of third commonwealth? Isn't this comparable to, to when the temple, you know, uh, uh, stood uh, in, in the second temple days? And enough with this Tisha B'Av stuff. Mm -hmm. so, so I think Israel is a, is a, is a stronger argument than, than the de facto argument that many people have, which is I, I can care less, so, so it doesn't mean anything to me. I mean, I was speaking to a colleague, a rabbinic colleague, who said, frankly, you know, this, this whole business about the destruction of the temple just means nothing to me. You know, I, I think we've done pretty well since the destruction of the temple. So, uh, you know, there are people that even say, oh, it's a big favor for us, because that's what loosened us up and made us be able to create rabbinic Judaism. So uh, without the destruction of the temple, who knows what kind of primitive you know, uh, backward yeah. kind of uh, religious, uh, uh, um, you know, approach we would still be involved in. Um, I find that a little uh, off-putting myself, but uh, but that's where people are. So these yeah. questions are real questions, and certainly throwing ourselves back into Rebbe's time, into the time of Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi, it's conceivable that he may have uh, actually had that kind of radical idea, but that subsequent generations just couldn't abide by it. Just like the sages of his own time said, we're not ready to give this up. Um, later sages said, we're not even ready to believe that Rabbi Yehuda Nasi even thought of such a thing. Mm -hmm. um, we know that Rabbi Yehuda Nasi did have some radical ideas. Um, in my own studies, for instance, about the sabbatical year, um, he is on the very, 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 very uh, lenient side of uh, of requiring observance of the sabbatical year. He felt that things were different, and that the sabbatical year no longer applied in many ways. Um, and he was shot down by his contemporaries, um, not literally, of course. Thank God. Um, but but uh, um, but his position seems to have been at odds with a lot of his colleagues in in reading the historical moment that he lived in and the implications of that historical moment for the observance of certain, um, uh, certain uh, halachot, uh, so certain, certain practices. So this is, this is the, uh, um, the way that, the, the, that the, uh, the tradition itself and history has softened that memory of, uh, of a, you know, a, a particularly possibly really radical idea that uh, is then softened out and and you know and and uh, brushed aside a little bit. Yes, Sylvia, let's try again. I still can't hear you. Maybe what you know what what happened? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I'm not a techie, but maybe if you shut down and then start again, try that. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So. Um, now we go back to the Purim question. We had a report that th this wasn't just a proposal that Rabbi Yehud Anasi made about canceling something, but he did something on Purim. He planted a plant on Purim. So what is that all about? So we're in the middle of the column 5B1. Okay, Beryl, you got it? The Gemara now questions Rebbe's act of planting a shoot on Purim. And how could Rebbe plant Hold on, wait, wait a second, a one shoot. second. Let's uh, one time out. Sylvia, let's do a test. <clears throat> Can you hear me now? Yes. So there it is. I would just go back one one step. We were talking about current Tisha B'Av. Yes. And I was wondering what the plans were this year, if it was going to incorporate Black Lives Matter. So I don't know that there that that's um, you know it, it hasn't been discussed that much, um, and I just said you know before that there have been other 
uh, discussions in the past about what kind of other causes or themes should be included. Um, so as I've you know gone on the record, I think pretty clearly, um, I think we need to stand with with uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, 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 movement and with the uh, uh, the Black community in general. I find that that's absolutely. I mean, from my perspective, that's no question. Um, and if people want to include Black Lives Matter into some kind of discussion about uh, um, you know what's happening and how we reflect on it as Jews, that's totally uh, uh, appropriate. I um, I don't. What I'm hearing from my uh, from BK, for instance, and maybe Nair Tamid, is that they still want to do something about refugees, that they still want to do something about ICE. You know, although they've been very active in terms of Black Lives Matter, also, but they seem to think that the that the connection for them is really a strong connection with that issue. And unfortunately, sadly, we have too many issues. You know, there are so many issues that we really, really need to respond to. Um, it's very hard to do justice to, to all of them. Um, and then we have to pick and choose when and where to do what. So I hear you, I hear your suggestion. And, uh, you know, nothing has been decided uh, uh, yet fully. So, you know, we'll put that into the hopper. Well, I'm just going to throw something way out of left field in, which is that... Um, here I am on the vineyard, and of course we have a tribal reservation headquarters, a mm. tribal headquarters here for the Wampanoags. And my son just read a book about the history of the Wampanoags. The Native American situation, as bad as the Black situation is, the Native situation is really much worse and much more basic to our current existence, right. at least as current, at least as basic. There's, there's, I, I agree with you. I think that the whole record of um, of, uh, of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the indigenous peoples is a record of 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 abominable shame. It's a, it's a, a you know, we we destroyed them. I mean, we didn't enslave them. You no, know, we just murdered them, wiped them out, and destroyed them. Uh, it was completely. easier. <laughs> so was well, yeah, and and uh, you know, then then we brought in after we did that. Then we brought in all these, uh, you know, all the all the slaves to do right. to do our our work for us. We've got a pretty ugly bunch of, of 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 things that we've done. Um, so yes, there's a lot of atonement that we need to uh, uh, to engage in and how to do that, and we're afraid to do it because the dimensions are so humongous that. Uh, um, that we just try to shy away from it. Um, I just saw that the uh, the um, Sunday review section of the Times uh, today uh, is devoted to economic uh, inequalities, and uh, I've made a point in our own conversations here at at Shomre that uh, I certainly recognize that that we're not the richest congregation in the world. But we have to make choices, and we have monies that we decide to allocate for one thing or another. And I've said it uh, before, and, and some people really did not appreciate my mentioning it, but we all want very, very high-tech capabilities for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur so that we can enjoy our holiday. The money that we spend on that equals more than the yearly salary of what we pay for our custodian. Um, so really? wow. so that's the proposal now. So the idea that maybe we should be paying a living wage to our essential workers um, is an idea that, that when I brought it up was considered to be um, out of line. So now people are beginning to calm down a little bit. It's a scary idea. It's a, it's a, uh, a very challenging, uh, question because it means rethinking how we organize ourselves and uh, that's not comfortable but if we don't do something now in response to the way everything has collapsed around us and, and during the pandemic um, when are we going to do it we're going to do it in another hundred years when 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 should we be doing it so I think that the conversation is really important now and I'm not you know, doing the dollars and cents here, and I'm not, uh, you know, prescribing 
what needs to be done and how the budget needs to be chopped up. But if we don't talk about it, we're never going to get anywhere. And one of the, th the good things about this Talmudic statement that we just had a second ago is better two than one. If more people talk about something, then the chance of coming up with good solutions, with good ideas, is increased. So if we shut down the conversation, nothing will get done and bad ideas will uh, have a better chance of, uh, of uh, being accepted. Um, hopefully, if more people talk about this, we can figure out a way to move forward in a, in a more equitable way, in a, in, in a way that, that uh, does Shomre um, proud. So yeah, good questions, hard questions. So let's go back now, Beryl, one more time. Thanks for your patience. Let's start again from the Gemara Now questions. The Gemara Now questions Rebbe's act of planting a shoot on Purim. And how could Rebbe plant a shoot on Purim? But Rav Yosef has taught the following Baraita. Scripture states regarding the days of Purim. Gladness and feasting and Yom Tov. Gladness, this teaches that it is forbidden to eulogize on Purim. Feasting, this teaches that it is forbidden to fast on Purim. And Yom Tov, this teaches that like Yom Tov, when work is forbidden, so too it is forbidden to work on Purim. Accordingly, how could Rabbi plant a shoot, which is an act of work on Purim? Right. So now we have a statement that, that reads uh, phrases in the Megillah, and this is now scripture. We've talked about this many times, to derive certain uh, rules and certain way of looking at the entire day of Purim. So we see this is a day of rejoicing, and therefore, we cannot have uh, elaborate funerals with, with uh, um, you know, long eulogies. Um, by the way, uh, in uh, contemporary practice, so this gets to be sticky. What happens to, you know, with a family? You're going to tell a family that if they have the bad luck of, of burying their loved one on Purim, that they're not going to be able to have a eulogy. They're not going to be able to say some words about uh, the, the life of the person that passed away. So the, um, the rule is stated here, but in practice, there's an exception. The exception is somebody who is important in the community. An Adam Chashuv, an Isha Chashuva, so a VIP. And then what we simply do is we say, for this family, their loved one is a VIP. So therefore, we then um, you know, go on with the eulog eulogizing anyway. So in many traditional uh, circles, what they do is they say, even though today is Purim, which is supposed to be a day of rejoicing and we should not say a sad word, but we can't help it because this person deserves everything um, to, you know, that, that we should say in, in recognition of their life and, and how we feel. And then the eulogizing proceeds. So there's a kind of a, an acknowledgement of Purim and then you go on anyway. We do something similar to that on Shabbat. Shabbat is a day of rest. Shabbat is supposed to be a day of sitting back and enjoying what we have without trying to change things. Nevertheless, we have a prayer for healing for people who are sick. So we recognize that, you know, guess what? It's not a perfect day for everybody. There are people out there that are suffering. So when I uh, have the, the uh, opportunity to offer a traditional uh, you know, healing prayer, not just the singing prayer, which is so beautiful and meaningful, but also the, the traditional Hebrew words, in that prayer for healing, we say, Shabbat hi miluzok urufuak rovalavo. It is Shabbat, so we, we're not going to yell and scream about this, but we are confident that healing will come about. So we include that in the prayer for healing. We acknowledge that it's Shabbat, it's a little bit of a different day, and we should be cognizant of the beauty of Shabbat and, and the, the, the good part that Shab of life that Shabbat gives us. But then we say, and hopefully that's, that's going to be, that good part will, will spread out and bring some healing to people. 
So Purim is a day of rejoicing, as it says here, and a day of feasting, which means that we're not allowed to fast on, on Purim. And then it says it's a, it's a Yom Tov. It's a Yontif. So since that word Yontif is mentioned in the verse, so the, the, this uh, um, uh, teaching by Rav Yosef says that that means that Purim needs to be a day that, to, that's observed the same way as Pesach and Sukkot and Shavuot. Purim needs to be a day that you, that there are no none of the work that that you that you were not to do on Shabbat, none of that work can be done on Purim either. So planting is constructive work. Planting is making the world more verdant, more alive. Um, uh, planting either gardens or food is an essential labor, and because it's an essential labor, you should do it for six days a week should absolutely engage in planting. And exactly those important works are not what you're supposed to do on Shabbat. So the same thing now applies, says Rabbi Yosef, to Purim. Purim has become so important in his eyes that we're not to do any work on Purim. Just a spoiler alert, we don't accept this opinion. Right? We don't, we don't, uh, we have uh, uh, accepted other opinions that don't make Purim a day that you can't go to work. But here we have uh, the record of a, of a sage who says this is Purim is like a you know is up there once we made it into a holiday we went all the way so the question now becomes well then how could Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi have violated the prohibition of working on Purim by planting a plant back to you Beryl the Gomorrah answers Rather, we must say that Rebbe lived in an unwalled city and therefore observed Purim on the 14th of Adar. And when he planted, he planted on the 15th. Ah, so now what they say, yes, it was Purim, but it wasn't Purim for him. It was Purim for other people because Purim has that funny way of, of operating that some people observe Purim on the 14th and other people observe Purim on the 15th. And therefore, um, when he planted on the 15th, that was Purim for some people, but it wasn't Purim for him. The, uh, the question that is sort of a little bit uh, touched on here or, or hinted at is the question of what happens if you are a resident of a place that observes Purim on the 14th, but you find yourself someplace else. You find yourself in a place that observes Purim on the 15th. So what do you do? Do you do what you're supposed to be doing? Or do you do what everybody else is doing? So here, possibly what's going on is the shock that made Rebbe's act uh, you know, notable so that people remembered it. Wow, Rebbe planted a plant on Purim was because he was of the opinion that I come from a town that observes Purim on the 14th. I happen to be traveling and now I'm in a town that observes the city, right? The walled cities observe on the 15th. I'm in, I'm in Jerusalem, let's say. And, but I'm not a person who usually observes Purim on the 15th. I observed Purim yesterday. When I was home in, in Tel Aviv, I read, I read Megillah and I celebrated Purim yesterday. And now this is just a regular day for me. So he's planting a tree in the JNF forest, right? Um, and everybody's going, wait a second, but it's Purim here, right? So that may be part of what's going on here. Jen. Um, isn't, isn't there a principle we have, though, that you shouldn't appear to be, like, even if you can do something, if it, you shouldn't appear to be, like, say, um, I don't know, your Gentile friend wants to give you a ride to shul, you can't do that, like, you can't have other people thinking that you're in a car on shul or, like, whatever, on, a, on Shabbat. So isn't there, like, a general thing that even if he already celebrated uh, Purim, he shouldn't, like, lead other people astray to thinking they can plant on Purim? Right. Just so because he can? Yeah. Right. Is it, it, shouldn't he be concerned with appearances? Right. The, I technical, mean, the technical term for that is marit ayin, how it looks, how it looks, how it looks to the eye. 
right? Without without the adequate information, but it looks bad, even though there are good good reasons for why a person is doing it. Everything is okay, but people will suspect that that person is actually doing something wrong. So even though you're really within your rights of doing it, you should avoid doing it. You're right. So there is such a concern, and then, but of course, that's a very uh, uh, um, uh, you know intangible kind of uh, 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 criterion. Um, so it's hard to apply that. And uh, the question here would be, you know, th does uh, um, you know does Rebbe worry about that? You know, maybe after all, he's he is Rebbe. You know, like people are watching this guy. So on the one hand. Everybody knows that he really comes from Sipori, and Sipori observes Purim on the 14th. So, you know, how much do you assume what people know? So, uh, um, it's it's that's that's definitely a question, right? But yeah, it, and it definitely was shocking to people. And now we're trying to you know find out how he could possibly have done this. Okay. Oh, and and, and in fact, he lived in in, in Tveria, not Sipori. So uh, that's what the Gemara is now going to say. Next, uh, uh, next paragraph. The Gemara refutes this answer. Is this so? But Rebbe lived in Tiberias, and Tiberias was surrounded by a wall in the days of Joshua, son of Nun. Thus, his day of Purim was the 15th of Adar. How then could he plant that day? Okay, so now we're going to go into some details, little little back and forth, and 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 uh, when we get to the next paragraph, we'll see this is not exactly the this, the biggest problem in the world, but they're just saying, wait a second, but just let's clarify some facts here. Where did actually Rebbe come from? He came from Tveria. He came from Tiberias. Tiberias is an ancient walled city. So what do you mean he planted on the fifteenth and he observed Purim on the fourteenth? He he regularly observed Purim on the fifteenth. So how could he plant on the on the 15th? So now the Gemara will get out of it very easily. Go ahead. The Gemara replies, Rather, we must reverse our previous assertion and say that Rebbe observed Purim on the 15th, for he lived in a walled city, i.e. Tiberias, and when he planted, it was on the 14th. Okay, simple enough. Okay, so we'll flip it around. He was planting on a day that was Purim for other people, but not for him. Now that we've established that the 15th was the Purim day for him, great. So he planted on the other day. He planted on the day that was Purim for other people, but it wasn't for him. We get, the Gemara, we Go. The Gemara questions this as well. And was Rebbe sure that Tiberius was surrounded by a wall in the days of Joshua, son of Nun, and thus observes Purim on the 15th? But Hezekiah read the Megillah in Tiberius on the 14th and 15th because he was uncertain whether it was surrounded by a wall in the days of Joshua, son of Nun, or not. Okay, so here we have, this is a, a tangent a little bit, back to the story about Tiberias, about Tveria itself, uh, um, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi's base. So even though Tveria is an old walled city, but now we have uh, reports that we didn't know how long back it goes. Does it really go all the way back to the time of Yehoshua ben Nun, to the time of Joshua, which is the criterion? for what when a walled city uh, observes Purim on the 15th. Maybe it wasn't all that old. Maybe it was not quite as old as that. So we have a sage, Chizkiah, who, because he was un uncertain whether Tiberia was such a city or not, if it was such a city, then its day was the 15th. If it wasn't such a city, then its day was the 14th. So when should you read Megillah? So according to what his practice was, he read the Megillah on both days. He read the Megillah on the 14th and on the 15th. Okay, so if it's if it's a uh, uh, you know a, a situation that's in doubt like that, Chizkiah made uh, the extra uh, effort to observe both days as Purim. So wouldn't Rebbe have done the same? And therefore, if he says that you're not allowed to work on Purim, 
then he shouldn't plant the, the shoot either on the 14th or on the 15th. Gemara answers. The Gemara replies, Hiskia was unaware of the status of Tiberius. However, Rabbi was sure that it is classified as a walled city. Okay, so here's now the, the Gemara simply saying, just because one person is not sure doesn't mean another person is not sure. Um, and here we have a little bit of a reflection back on the, on the strong um, personality of Rebbe who has his own ideas about things. Just because somebody else doesn't feel secure in deciding a situation, Rebbe was fine with deciding. And he said, I'm sorry, your, your questions about the status of Tiberia don't bother me. I have come to the definite conclusion that Tiberia, Tiberias, is a, was a walled city from the time of Joshua, and that's all there is to it. So even though one sage was un, un, unsure about something, the other sage was. So again, it brings us into the, uh, the real world of that time when it came to rabbinic Judaism, which was that it was fragmented, that there were different people doing different things, um, because of their convictions and not necessarily uh, um, reaching a consensus. They strove for consensus. They strove uh, on big important things to get some, some kind of practical uh, path forward for the community. But here we still see that those things need to be sorted out and they don't always get to, you know, defined for everybody uh, once and for all. Yeah, Stuart. Yeah, so, I mean, this is a problem that I just struggle with whenever we read Talmud, and I don't expect you to answer it in the general, in general terms, which is, you know, sort of whose authority is most reliable. Um, but specifically with regard to Rebbe, so, I mean, uh, in some sense it seems like he's, the fountainhead of all this. He's the redactor of Mishnah. And yet he's also so early that a lot of these problems haven't really been even identified, yet alone resolved. So if he's, um, I mean, his authority is as great as any uh, any rabbi in, in all of Talmud, right? But how do you, so how do you disagree with Rebbe? How do you, um, you know, you, you know what, what's his status in when it comes to okay? So Hillel is going to say something later, or or Akiva, or Yochanan ben Zachai, or some other rabbi. Just you know, what? How do how do we deal with his um, his preeminence in being the redactor of Mishnah? So I want to I I again in the broadest sense of everything in the Talmud and all of the questions that come up in this kind of vein. I'm not going to answer it, but with, in terms right. of Rebbe and, and Rebbe as an example, we right. have to actually uh, reject your assumption. Okay. Rebbe was the titular head of the rabbinic community and of all of the Jewish community because he was placed in his position by the Romans. And that actually facilitated his, uh, his ability to, to produce um, uh, rabbinic mm -hmm. uh, you know, teachings, out, promulgate them into the, into the public because he was the recognized communal leader by the Romans. However, he was not, by virtue of that, necessarily the rabbinic authority. And he was a respected rabbi, very respected rabbi, um, and he certainly had the, the means to uh, um, put his ideas out in an effective way. However, other rabbis felt totally uh, uh, empowered to disagree with him. And in fact, the Mishnah, which he is given credit for producing, does not follow his opinion all the time. And he, so he's responsible. He's the, he's the editor-in-chief of a, of a document that in the end he leaves completely open to the real workers that were producing the document to decide whether to include his opinion or not. Very often his opinion is not included and sometimes it's included and, and the context allows other people to say, well, it's a minority opinion and we don't actually accept it. 
So the fact that he was the communal leader did not make him the religious authority. So the, the title prince comes from the Romans? Yes. Okay. Well, it comes from both. He, he is the, the prince of the, uh, of the Jewish community and accepted by the Jewish community. I mean, he wasn't a puppet uh, governor that the, that the, you know like for instance on the roman side you had pontius so you had all these you know whatever other uh roman uh you know authorities that were there that were imposed that were imposed on the jewish community he was accepted and he was accepted as part of of a, of a scholarly line so rabban gamliel whose name we've had uh, uh any time uh many times before and uh, there are more than one rabban gamliel that family was the patriarchal family and they claimed royal lineage they claim to have derived uh, uh from king david from the dynasty of king david but they weren't kings um and they they were princes so they were recognized as ultimate political communal leaders and they were recognized as great sages but they were not the pope they were not infallible and they were not whatever their word said went so, for instance, we just had this whole uh, uh, report that Rebbe had an idea about Tisha B'Av. However, we finally figure out what his idea was about slightly changing Tisha B'Av, you know, uh, temporarily uh, erasing Tisha B'Av, whatever it is. But what is the report? The sages disagreed. The sages didn't accept his opinion. So this, so this is this is the, this is the, the opinion. Wait, Sorry. this is the way it's been in rabbinic circles all the time, throughout the Mishnah and the Talmud. The picture that we have is of a re very robust uh, culture of disagreement with no one being able to impose their authority on anybody else. Certain people you know, are recognized as, as greater sages than somebody else, but even when they're recognized as greater sages, they may, in any particular issue, not carry the day. Yeah. Hillel didn't always, always win. But right. Usually. Right. Right. But just one other quick question. So when, when it talks about Rebbe's act of planting the shoot, so it seems like there's a distinction between cases where the rabbis are making a specific argument or taking a position and other cases where they're just kind of doing it um, in their own way or in a distinctive way. Right. And well, I don't know whether anything flows from that, but he's he's not well, expressing the view that it's okay to plan things on Purim. He's just planning it on Purim. Right. And that's the that's the more shocking idea. Because if you're in the in the study hall and you say, I think we should, and somebody else says, Well, I'm I think we shouldn't. Right. We take a vote. We take a vote. And and the majority is we don't. So even though I was of the opinion that it was okay. Then, if I am going to play by the rules of the community, I'll right. go along with the opinion that I actually disagree with, right. and I abide by that opinion. So, when right. somebody goes out there and actually does something, then that means they are so convinced that what they're doing is right that they're they've got free free a free pass yeah. to do it, and that's what now causing trouble for the Gemara. Actually, we have done this. Subversive. Yeah. If, if we can't figure out a way that justifies it, then we've got a, a very serious problem. And that's Rabbi? what we're not doing, trying to justify it. Yeah, Josie. But yesterday in Kosher Salt, or Wednesday, you read about a rabbi who was excommunicated. Because he refused to go with the majority. He was so stubborn about saying, I know I'm right, and I don't care what everybody else says. And that's the tragedy of that story. The story of Rabbi Eliezer ben Hurkanus was that he was recognized as one of the greatest, greatest, greatest sages of his day. He didn't persuade the rabbis, his colleagues, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about it, that to accept his opinion on a particular matter. And then instead of graciously bowing to their majority rule, mm. he stood his ground. And that's when he got excommunicated. Because that's when the community of sages said, we honor you. And that's the rest of the story. And that's what we've been, you know, we're going to wrap it up uh, soon. But the tragedy of his uh, uh, career is that he was absolutely universally recognized as one of the greatest, greatest. But then he deprived himself of participation in that very community that valued him so much 
because he didn't want to because he didn't want to accept majority rule. Uh, okay. Now That's back to the bigger of question that Stuart asked before: majority rule doesn't necessarily always get decided. You know, if you have a Congress, or you know, even look with Congress in the Supreme Court, you can have a majority rule today, and then a generation later, you overturn that majority rule. So history is the ultimate arbiter. When we decide who's right and who's wrong, or whose view carries the day, forget about whether it's right or wrong, um, that's history. So the, the records of discussions in the Talmud, most of the time leave it open for, for the community to adopt whatever path it decides to adopt. And those are mysterious uh, uh, um, processes. When do we actually decide to go with certain opinions or 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 not um you know history is is funny the the talmud does not present itself as a law book it presents itself as a discussion book right okay so now we're, oh. yeah you Good. said okay so <laughs> all right so now we're up to the gemara however asks the Gemara, however, asks, and if Rebbe was sure that Tiberius is classified as a walled city and therefore its residents certainly read on the 15th, is it permitted to plant on the 14th? But it is written in Megillah Ta'anit. Right. The, the, the fasting scroll. This was a scroll that we had re referred to also when we were learning Ta'anit, the, the, the tractate Ta'anit. The word Ta'anit means fasting. And like Ta'anit Esther, Ta'anit Esther, the fast of Esther, um, or Ta'anit, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Asarab Tevet, the 10th of Tevet, and so on, all these other fasts. So the word Ta'anit means a fast. Um, we have a tractate that talks about fasting as that we studied. But in early, early, early times, there was a scroll which listed days in the calendar that were special days. It was called Megillah Tanit, the scroll of fasting, because it was really mostly about days that you couldn't fast, because there were certain celebrations that dotted the, the ancient calendar of, of the Jews um, that precluded uh, um, uh, fasting on those days. So now we're going to be having a citation from that scroll. The 14th day and the 15th day of Adar are the days of Purim, on which it is forbidden to eulogize. And okay, so that's, the, that's the quote, right? So the, the quote is a short quote. It's in Aramaic. And it says, that's Purim. Purim is the 14th and the 15th. No mourning practices, right? And which means also no fasting. We had that already in the previous uh, column. Okay, and now Rava explains. And Rava had said in reference to this statement, this was necessary to be stated in Magilat Ta'anit only okay, now we're on the next page, 5b2. Forbid those who observe Purim on this day, the 14th, to engage in fasting and eulogy on the other day, the 15th. And those who observe Purim on the other day, the 15th, to engage in fasting and eulogy on this day, the 14th. Regardless of whether one observes Purim on the 14th or the 15th, the restrictions of Purim, eulogy, fasting, and work, apply on both days. Therefore, how could Rebbe have planted on the 14th of the Dar? Okay, so the question is clear. Since we have now a uh, an ancient record which says that whichever day you read the Megillah, the other day you should honor also as a quasi day of rejoicing. Don't cloud that day with fasting and eulogizing and so on. So I mentioned the business about when you have a, a, a funeral on that day. If you have a choice, don't do the funeral on that day. Right? Do it on the next day. Yeah, Sylvia. You just mentioned a few moments ago that the Talmud is not a law book; it's a discussion. So. Where would you say uh, the laws I gather are derived from the Torah? Is that correct? Yes. Good. Uh, but the discussion in the Talmud is always based on what those laws may or may not mean. 
Right, so, and, they're, and they're also based on other laws. The Migilat Ta'anit, for instance, is a record of laws that were adopted by the community after the Torah, right? This is what's called the Oral Torah. But the Oral Torah has many dimensions. The Oral Torah has the kinds of discussions that we're doing right now. And the Oral Torah also incorporates the decision-making and the record of the decision-making of communities and the community about how we go forward as Jews. So that accumulates over time. That's what I was saying. This is a historical process and the record will reflect it. But there's a difference between saying, let's create a law book, which tells us what's the law in any particular circumstance. That's like the Shulchan Aruch, right? The Shulchan Aruch is a law book. It purports exactly to be that. I'm gonna give it to you by topic, by, by, by subject matter, by, by, by sub-subject matter. I'm gonna give you all of the laws. This is what's right, this is what's wrong, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, this is how you should do it, this is how you shouldn't do it, etc. The Talmud understands that that's a, a, you know, a definitive dimension of Jewish experience, but the Talmud's job is not to determine those laws, but to discuss them and to discuss and record the fact that different people had different understandings and different suggestions or different opinions about what the law should be without nailing down what the final decision is. As I understand it, in today's practice of at least conservative Judaism, and I presume most others, the decision of halacha rests with the rabbi, the leader of the congregation. The, the, is that correct? To an extent. It, it, it rests, it, first of all, every community, like the, every denomination, let's say, has a very different idea about how to approach halacha. So the reform movement is the least bound by halacha. The reform movement has made a decision that's part of the definition of what makes it a movement of accepting overall an approach to halacha, which says halacha has a, uh, um, you know, has, has, has a, uh, an opinion to offer, but we don't feel bound by halacha. So uh, when we make decisions about what we should do as Jews, it doesn't necessarily have to follow what anybody decided for us ahead of uh, beforehand. That's that was a, 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 a you know a, a considered decision on the part of the rabbis of the reform movement, and that's what made the reform movement the reform movement. The Orthodox movement, at least in theory, says the halacha is absolutely binding, and we have no choice but to follow halacha. The only thing is halacha and life are complicated. So in any particular situation, go to an expert, go to your local rabbi who has been trained to understand what the halacha has been saying and why it says that and, in a, and how to apply it in particular cases. Why does the Supreme Court have to decide laws? You know, we have all these laws written on the book. The answer is because does the law really apply in this case? Is it, is it, is it uh, you know, judged correctly and so on? So there's always more, more decisions that have to be made about applying the law. Who gets to, to, to decide that? So in the Orthodox world, there are, you know, there's a hierarchy of rabbis. The local rabbi is the decisor. And then you get up to, you know, rabbis who are considered greater rabbis and uh, people who publish, uh, you know, certain rules and, and, and decisions and so on and so forth. And you have, you know, uh, councils of sages and so on, in theory. The conservative movement is in the middle. Conservative movement accepts halakha. However, it gives a lot more room for local decision making and for contemporary decision making because conservative movement is based on the idea that halakha does change and that halakha needs to respond to contemporary realities. And that makes it very complicated because there's a tremendous weight of tradition that is definitive and authoritative, but at the same time, there's a conviction that any particular situation might have within it a sufficient, you know, cause to, to create a new law. And that also becomes the judgment of the local rabbi. So the, the term is Mara Da'atra, it comes from the Talmud. And uh, I mentioned it in, in the message that I sent to the community 
whenever it was, a month and a half ago, that the conservative movement says, look, we have a law committee where we have all kinds of people deliberating and writing and researching what the law should be. But in the end, the ultimate decision in any community is on the so shoulders of the local rabbi. The local rabbi needs to make the decision based on their own best understanding of the case, the tradition, the needs. So the empowerment is with the rabbi um, and the responsibility is huge. And if I can just say one more thing, it, it's, it, and yet um, it, the most, uh, the strictest parts of the religion rely on the Talmud, and yet the Talmud is such an open-ended document. Um, that, that, you know, again, it's, it's open-ended within a particular kind of world. The, the Talmud is not open-ended to the, to the extent of saying you don't have to keep Shabbat anymore. The Talmud is not open-ended to the extent that it says you don't have to keep kosher anymore. Talmud is not uh, open-ended about you know to the extent that you don't have to worship God. Um, there are basic, you know, uh, values and principles and laws that the Talmud will never question. Right? So those those you know the the open-endedness is is in the interstices, is in the 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 you know the spaces in between. Okay, so just to review what this says is that according to this understanding, uh, both days of Purim everywhere need to be honored. Whichever day you're reading the Megillah, the other day needs to be honored as a day of rejoicing anyway. So, and rejoicing and forbidden work. So how did Rebbe uh, violate that by planting? Here we go. The Gemara questions this. No, the Gemara replies. Oh, the Gemara replies. These words, i.e. the application of restrictions of Purim to both days, are true only in the case of eulogies and fasts. But work is forbidden just one day and no more. Okay. So now the Gemara backtracks. And the Gemara says, you know what? Maybe not. Maybe we're going too far. The idea of honoring the second day of Purim, that you're not really reading the Megillah on yourself, that second day should be a day of rejoicing. We get it. But that you shouldn't go to work or that you shouldn't do work on that day? No. We're not going to impose that kind of uh, 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 burden on people. And remember, that is a burden. Two days of not working. You know, ask anybody who tries to to, to observe two days of Yantiv. Um, it's, it's definitely... Uh, a, a sacrifice. It's definitely a commitment that has to be made. So that's fine for the Torah's, you know, uh, obligations, but that we're going to create a new holiday called Purim with two days of not doing work consecutively. So now the Gemara is backtracking. The Gemara questions this. Is it so that work is forbidden only one day and permitted the other day? But Rav saw a man who was selling flax on Purim. And he, Rav, cursed him for working on Purim, and his flax did not grow. The Gomorrah answers, there, it was a case of a man who observed Purim that day. Okay, so now we have another anecdote from a different sage, that somebody actually went out and was working on Purim. And the sage saw this person violating Purim, and cursed them and the curse worked because the the planting of the flax that he did was unsuccessful so we see that the sage was right we see that the sage's uh, displeasure with this person was correct and that meant that the person's activity of planting on that day was wrong so now we have an anecdote with a with a kind of a you know a voice from heaven his curse really worked so, um, you know, why should that person be cursed and Rebbe be okay? You know, it, it shouldn't be okay for Rebbe to plant that, that, uh, that seed or sapling or whatever plant he was planting on Purim. Um, 
So the answer that the Gemara gives is, no, 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 but that was the very day that this person had read Megillah. So he was violating that day of Purim. While again, back to Rebbe, Rebbe reads on the 15th, but he planted it on the 14th. Yes, Jen. Um, I thought a voice from heaven doesn't necessarily make them something correct. So I, I, why I, would that I, emerge? I, I purposely used that phrase to sort of, uh, you know, be a little provocative. You're right. We don't, we don't uh, take that as proof of anything on the one hand. On the other hand, this sage, his strong opinion was that this is wrong and that's why he was provoked to, uh, um, you know, to curse the person to begin with. What we see, by the way, in terms of just uh, uh, a car, uh, you, know, a, 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 you know, something that comes out of this is Rav couldn't punish him in any other way. It's not like you could bring him to court. The enforcement powers of the sage were very limited, right? He had a bully pulpit, so to speak, where he could say what he thought, but he really couldn't force anybody to abide by it. So he ended up, uh, you know, making a very strong statement in public, a curse on this person, but he certainly couldn't bring him, uh, you know, he couldn't put him in jail, he couldn't fine him, he couldn't do any of the legal uh, kinds of enforcement that we take for granted as, as being, you know, substantive enforcement of the law. Um, Although, like, destroying his crop seems like a pretty big deal. <laughs> I didn't destroy it. <laughs> he engaged in something that wasn't right, and it didn't pay off, right? This is, uh, this is what he would say, right? What Rob would say is, why should, why should a sinner enjoy the fruits of, of, uh, of uh, ill-gotten gains, right? Um, so, uh, in, and in that sense, Heaven was 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 uh, behind him. Um, okay, so we're going to stop here. Uh, we're going to be continuing with these uh, issues that that will swirl around and around and around. Um, and uh, I look forward, hopefully, to next week. And uh, happy fifth, uh, to, as they say, right uh, for today. Okay, Zag isn't to everybody. If I can. Bye bye. Thank you.